As you can see, the uh, title of my talk is Learning Out Loud, Theory and Practice of Knowledge Building in Digital Spaces. And what I hope you'll see is that this isn't about how to use the bells and whistles to become um, super learners. It's really about using what we already have and exploiting or leveraging what's around us to facilitate learning. And I want to start with the question about it's quite basic, how do we learn? And for, for me, the better question is, how do we learn best? And by learning, I want to emphasize that learning for me has two components. One is memory or being able to actively recall information. And the other is transfer or being able to apply your learning to multiple contexts, not just one narrow context. So memory and transfer. So let's explore how we learn best and have a look at this familiar scene here on the left. So this is your standard lecture hall. And what I'd like to do to begin to answer that question about how we learn best is to talk about a study out of Harvard University from an introductory physics class with first year students, first year science students. And the students both study conditions. And most of the study condition was like what you see on the left, this traditional lecture style. The lecturer, the instructor was highly skilled, really knowledgeable about the subject matter, and also had received additional training to make um, their delivery even more engaging and interesting for the students. And the students in all condition or in both conditions had a handout with empty spaces and blanks for them to fill out as they listened. So you could say that it was contrasting active and passive learning, but I feel that just by listening and taking notes that there's a little bit of an active learning component uh, in both conditions. So again, in both conditions, there was a lecturer um, talking about two different um, topics within introductory physics. The students listened and took notes and the only difference between the two conditions was when they arrived at the problem solving stage. At that stage, the condition on the left continued to listen as the uh, instructor kind of did a, a think aloud protocol and still continued to solve the problem very publicly. And the students wrote down what the instructor was doing. At the end, they received the fully worked out solution. Um, they had records of that. In the experimental condition, the students listened and when they received, um, when they arrived at that problem solving stage, they, experience the condition on the right, which is getting into a smaller group to solve the problem themselves. But with that instructor nearby, here I've got them represented with this little um, speaking bubble. So the instructor was there to answer questions. And then at the end, they too received the fully worked out solution. So these students at the end of both conditions took two different kinds of tests. One was a test of learning of their, their knowledge that they attained through that um, lecture and experience, problem solving. And the other was their feeling of learning. And the results um, are kind of where we start to understand the difference between uh, the two questions that I asked at the beginning. As you can see, in the feeling of learning test, we had passive in the gray and active in the uh, really dark gray. So in all conditions, in all questions, the students clearly enjoyed the passive learning experience more. They felt they learned more. They felt the instructor was better, more effective, and they wished all of their physics courses would be taught in this passive approach. So that clearly won out in the feeling of learning. But look over here in the test of learning, in, all, in both cases, there were two different subjects that they looked at. In both cases, both subjects and two conditions, the active learning group consistently outperformed the passive learning group. And so what that tells us is that we all have this mismatch. And the mismatch is between how we feel we learn best and how we actually learn best. And this type of study has been replicated across study groups, different conditions, different skills, for example, reading and rereading versus actively recalling. And in all conditions, the findings indicate that we feel we learn better when we're more passive. It's called the illusion of fluency. So if I'm reading a book and I'm really enthralled by it or even reading a research paper and I get it as I'm listening, I get it, I understand it's still not nearly as effective as if I'm actively doing something with the content. 
So let's explore why that is the case. Um, and I like to contrast and explain this through nature and nurture. Um, and what we know before we head into that um, nature and nurture discussion is that teaching does not actually equal learning. And that kind of is a, a, a painful thing for all of us to hear. And I think perhaps an even more appropriate slide would be being taught does not equal learning. And again, I wanna remind you that learning for me is memory and transfer. So here we have the nurture, the nature side of, the, of understanding this. And our human brain uh, takes up only two or 3% of our entire body mass, but it consumes 20 or more percent of our resting metabolism, our calories. And our brain's tendency, of course, and how we've been able to evolve is to conserve energy and save it for when we may need it in emergency situations or some sort of scarcity. So the two most expensive activities for the brain in terms of energy expenditure are movement with our body and learning something new. So this helps us to understand why um, we tend to appreciate a more passive approach because although we're entertained and we're engaged, we are not actively doing anything with the content and we're conserving energy. So this puts us into this familiar uh, kind of a tape recorder approach to learning and especially in more formal settings. So we're taking in information, we have this illusion of fluency, but we're really more like tape recorders, not really necessarily processing the information in any great depth. And our brains actually are conserving energy in this scenario. So this is why the scenario on the left is quite familiar to us, it's quite comfortable for us, and it does have its place. So I'm not going to argue that we get rid of direct instruction. I'm a really strong proponent of direct instruction and lecturing uh, and watching videos and reading. So I'm not suggesting that we eliminate those. I'm just suggesting that we have to think about what we do with the information we're taking in and to be mindful of this illusion of fluency that we get by understanding the concepts really well. So another way to look at this, we looked at nature. Another way to look at this is our history and how we've come to um, develop this approach to education. And that means that, sorry, I'm just looking at my other screen here. Um, it helps to think about our nurture and how this has evolved over time. So on the left, you see this scarcity, and that refers to our scarcity of information. And I want to give uh, credit to Dave Cormier um, for this um, kind of continuum of information that he talks about. So millennia ago, there was a scarcity of information and sort of communal knowledge that was held by the powerful and the few who would dispense of it at will, uh, according to who were in the inner circles, for example even as we started to learn to read and write, and that's not a natural human skill, by the way, our brains are not wired for reading and writing. We have to be um, intentional about that. Even as we started to learn to read and write, those skills or literacy was still, they were still in the hands of the powerful who held the information and it trickled down. So there truly was this scarcity of information. And even with this, uh, the Gutenberg press in the 15th century, information became replicable and, and it was uh, more easily disseminated. But for education and formal education, the die had been cast. And centuries prior to this, um, universities like uh, Cambridge and Oxford had already formed. And if we were to look in a university classroom at that time and today, we would see very similar scenarios. And again, that's not necessarily bad, but we have to think about the other side of the coin and helping ourselves and our learners to be more active with that content. So of course, there was mass production of books which made information um, dissemination much easier. And then over time through radio, television and internet, we've, that whole scenario is flipped on its head. We now have this abundance of information or an input flood or what feels like an avalanche of information but we still are learning and teaching with this narrow scarcity mindset. So this is another way that helps us to understand um, how we've come to have this mismatch. Our brains want to conserve energy and we have been formed over the years to learn with a more scarcity mindset and also to teach. 
So we have a mismatch between how we feel we learn best and how we actually learn best. And this has really taken me a very long time to understand, even though I've been studying and obsessed about education for a really long time. And that's really my identity. Uh, ever since I entered a classroom, I have been obsessed about teaching and learning and how to do it best. And really the metaphor for me or the, the mantra is on the right here, where if you want the fruit, you have to climb the tree. And for me, the fruit was this knowledge, this information that others held, like my teachers or the newspaper or a book or a documentary. So I'm an apt or, and I'm sort of, uh, I revere these people who hold knowledge and I take it in and I have this illusion of fluency and that I get it, I know how, to do this. But on the flip side, I haven't really, I had not really been applying it to myself. And this really came um, home for me when I was doing my doctorate, which I did in my 50s. And at age 50, when I sat with my doctoral advisor to practice the oral comprehensive exam, she asked me a practice question. So I went to grab my notes and she said, wait, no, no, no. <laughs> You can't use your notes in the exam. Let's just practice. You've been studying for two years. You're a good, strong student. Answer the question. And this floored me. My face went white. I lost all color. I started to sweat. I could not answer. I could not actively pull the information to mind that I'd been studying diligently for two years. But I was taking an in information more like the tape recorder. And this was Oddly enough, or ironically, in cognitive science, my doctorate is in mind, brain, and teaching. And so I'd been taking it in, but I could not talk about it, and I was not applying it clearly to myself. So she gently said, look, you know this. Um, rather than going back and rereading and rereading and rereading, stop and apply those six principles from that article that we have mountains of research from, apply that to your learning and start being active. So I had to really unfreeze 50 years of studying like this tape recorder mindset. I had to really let go and unfreeze and make this big pivot in how I learn. Otherwise I would not have been able to uh, pass the comprehensive exam for my doctorate. So that's what I did. And what I learned along the way in um, that intense time and sort of identity shaking time was that a teaching does not equal learning and we have this mismatch between how we feel we learn best and how we actually learn best and in order to be to actually learn so that you remember and are able to transfer the information you have to be quite active internally and externally and I've come to think of that as learning out loud. And that's really what I did for two weeks straight, morning, noon, and night around my house. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the techniques that um, I applied and knew that there were, it was over a century of research to support. And turning it around was really quite uncomfortable. And as we know, change is really painful sometimes, especially after decades of nerddom thinking that you're right. So what I want to uh, discuss now are really the, the principles of what I call learning out loud and to think about how we can all do this on the continuum. And it's not about giving up sort of how we traditionally take information in uh, through listening and reading all the way to the end when we may share it digitally. There's not really much you have to give up at all. It's about tweaking what you're doing and kind of pressing pause ultimately. So we have this standard continuum. Notice that the arrows move in both directions because we move along this continuum day in and day out. So with this passive approach, um, I think it's actually more helpful to let go of the passive active continuum and to think rather about internal and external. That's why the out loud bit is about getting things out of this passive tape recorder and getting it active even in our minds. So internally, I want to talk about two effects that are um, really well supported by the research, and that's the imagining effect and the production effect. So for imagining, it's truly about stopping, pressing pause, walking away from the content, and imagining either a visual or a scenario or a process playing out in your mind. 
Uh, and that leads to a great bump in your learning. Um, the assessment, sorry, the research shows that there's always a bump in your learning when you stop and imagine um, the information actually happening or even applying it. it. So you don't actually have to learn out loud. You can have it all going on inside your head. Equally, if you take a concept and you say it out loud or even mouth the words, you experience what's called the production effect. And that leads to a 15% bump in your memory. So imagine that just by saying a word out loud or mouthing it, the words that you produce are uh, retained and you're able to recall them much more successfully uh, by 15%. So that's kind of an internal view of the um, taking in information. And again, that comes from researchers who published their work in 2017, but the research has also been done since the early 70s, so well over 50 years. So that's internal. I'd also like to think about being a consumer and a prosumer of information. And a prosumer is purely, it's nothing new. It's, it's someone who's able to take in information, but also to create content with what, they, with, um, what they've consumed or taken in. And we all do that. It's just a, a groovy and cool new term to consider. Um, so let's look at what that might look like in that whole process. And that will basically be the focus for the rest of my talk. So here we have our standard taking in information either through direct instruction or a lecture um, that we listen to or that we read about. And then we press pause and think about it. And here's where I want um, to share a quote with you from cognitive psychologist, uh, Daniel Willingham. Memory is the residue of thought. And that seems really obvious to us right now, but stop and think when we stop and process and either imagine or even produce something, mouth the words, mouth the context or the, the concept, it leads to memory. So memory is the residue or the result of thought. And I think that's a really powerful um, quote for us to take with us as we consider this. And that's really what I did in those remaining two weeks before my exam is even when I didn't have um, something I could write down nearby, for example, if I was in the shower, out for a walk or driving, I was actively pulling information into my mind and recalling it, imagining different um, ways of organizing it, different relationships among concepts and just trying to articulate my thoughts out loud and really thinking about them um, internally. So taking the information and thinking about it, it helps to have a structure. And here I, I like to turn to um, generative learning by Fiorella and Mayer. And they've done a, a seminal book. Uh, they've written a seminal book in 2015. But essentially their framework is all about three main steps, which is to select the information, organize it, and then integrate it with what you already know or something that you've created. But we need to attend to the information first, right? We need to manage this abundance of information, this input flood or avalanche. So with this thought bubble here, I would like you to think about having kind of a, a headlamp on if you're going camping or you're a, a miner. Um, and you walk into this room, which is the internet or the abundance of information that we have on our televisions, our radios, and of course, through our devices, it can be overwhelming. So we have to manage our attention if we're going to learn effectively. And I really do envision having this headlamp on and shining a light amid this black hole of information. And therefore, I am in control and I'm actively now able to select the content that is important to me. And I think our students really face this input flood and they're kind of drowning in information. And this may be why they may just grasp at the first hit they get in a Google search, for example. But if we pause and think about the information and set our attention with this sort of beam of light that is our attention, we're able to take it in. So that's the select part. The organized part, which is what I've represented here with the image above the garbage can, is really about making sense of the information. And that could be by organizing it, putting it into order, comparing it, finding relationships, but also finding mismatches, um, just doing something that makes sense with what you've taken in. 
And you also have to discard information. If it doesn't fit, if it's, if it's too much for the problem that you have to solve, you have to prune it or get rid of it. So that is kind of an overview of the select portion and the organized portion. And then the integrate portion of generative learning is really about connecting it with something you already know or using your environment around you to, to do more with the information. And by uh, thinking carefully about it, we're building that um, residue of information as well. What we have to be careful of is cognitive overload. So we may take in information and we do through all of our senses. We're, we're not really conscious of the amount of information we take in. For what we want to actively process, remember we're gonna select and then organize and integrate. That's mental cognitive processing. But our minds, our short-term memory or our working memory, it's called, can only manage three to five elements at a time. So this is again why we have to be very intentional with this um, beam of light. We have to limit what we bring into our minds at, at a time if we're um, processing it, solving a problem, doing that making sense step of comparing and contrasting. We have to be really intentional about not taking too much information and, and truly prune and get rid of uh, content that isn't helping us at that moment because that leads to cognitive overload and it your learning then just becomes a, a means ends relationship you're just doing it simply to correct something or to solve a problem quickly but it's more like about getting something right or wrong and not really deeper learning so what you can do in that case as you take an information that's valuable but you can't manage it is think about cognitive offloading. I really like this term. And that it's really just about using the environment around you, which you've already been doing uh, all of your lives, I'm sure. But what science is finding now is that we really have to get out of this brain-centric approach to learning and really leverage the materials, the environment around us. Um, so that uh, the research calls it either an environmental support or if you want a really sexy term at the end of today to uh, use at cocktail parties, um, an external memory field. And of course, I'm going to take us up to the digital world as one of those fields so that we can use for um, learning. But we always have paper and pen around us. And there are a couple of uh, really compelling um, sets of findings from the research I want to share with you. So this image here is just simply about taking information down on paper. And I want to ask you, I'm going to pause and just ask you to think about, do you think it's more effective to write down the information in words, including in your own words through elaboration? Or is it maybe more helpful to take down information with images included? And if you want to chat in your guests or just think about it, that's up to you. And I'll move on with the findings. Um, Research by Wamas Fernandez and Mead at university, uh, they started, yes, Cindy, you're absolutely right, images. And I'll share some really compelling research with you from this uh, group of researchers at Waterloo University in Canada and Queen's University. And they've done extensive research that's been replicated um, in the university classroom where they introduced the students to a number of different conditions, uh, including always this option to take down information in images. And across the board, students who took down information in words or images, um, the participants were able to recall more than twice the drawn information than the written information. And that includes elaboration. So these are already successful learners. They're in university and they've likely been taking down information in words for most of their lives. Yet when they were taking down words with images or just images alone, they were able to recall, actively recall, more than double the drawn concepts than the written concepts. So that's the university classroom. I'm hoping you're all here because you're interested in your own learning as well. I'm 55 now, so I'm always interested in how do these data and these findings relate to me as a, a lifelong learner who learns independently, not maybe in a lecture hall. 
So the same set of researchers have done comparisons across the lifespan and they have found almost identical results in that, again, taking down information in uh, with drawing included or just drawings alone gives you this enormous bump in um, memory. And perhaps the most, actually, I'll just go first to show you the findings at university. Um, so you can see the green bar is, oh, is the drawing condition. And you can see that this was just in one um, paper that they published. And many of these have been replicated across the years. But in all cases, drawing outperforms writing, um, listing, viewing an image. Notice that viewing an image has a bit of a bump over writing. So our visual cortex, which takes up about a third of our mental processing, is something that we really need to start thinking about tapping when we're learning. So, and that includes imagining, and it also includes, you know, putting pen to paper and drawing because these results are just so compelling uh, for me personally. I think it's really something we have to pay attention to. So the last example I wanna give you related to the drawing effect has to do with um, folks who are at the other end of the age spectrum in their late 70s, early 80s. And the same set of researchers examined um, basically the same conditions, but they included a group of folks who uh, were living with probable dementia. So typically healthy aging adults in their um, 70s and 80s, along with folks in the same age group with probable dementia. And uh, the results were just incredible. So the control group is this typically aging group, and this is the probable dementia group, again, with drawing, really having these phenomenal results. And in these cases, the data indicate that participants in both groups were able to recall more than four and five times the drawn words than the written words. And you may be thinking, oh, this is fine for them. I'm not very artistic and I'm not very creative. I hear this from my students all of the time. And I need to assure you that across all of these um, studies, they controlled for uh, so-called creativity and drawing skill. And it has no factor whatsoever. It's the act of drawing on that visual cortex, which takes up a, one third of our um, processing, plus our motor cortex, and then deepening the learning by trying to take abstract concepts sometimes and making them concrete. So that's just a depth of processing. It makes sense when we look at it that way, that when we get it out of our heads and we pause and think about it, and then we try to depict the information with images so it's not only with, it's not without words, you can certainly combine words with images, but it certainly is beneficial to take that extra step and to try to sketch out your understanding um, and really benefit from this drawing effect. All right, the last stage involves working with others, either in person or online. And that's what I am doing right now, mostly with my research around digital literacy and my collaboration with, um, other faculty members and the Lougheed Learning Center. So I want to uh, point you in the direction if you're thinking about applied learning or in the workplace, there's a program developed by John Stepper called Working Out Loud. It's been, it's over a decade in its um, existence. And he offers a lot of uh, free content if you're interested in working out loud, which simply means um, an online learning community or community of practice you're probably familiar with. So working out loud leads to great benefits and it's simply about connecting with others, sharing your information and building that content together, which we all are quite familiar with. And that reminds me of the uh, condition from the Harvard study where students, when they had to work together to solve a problem, their learning was deeper despite not feeling they were learning uh, as effectively. So there's that aspect of learning as well as, again, back to the aging population, um, John Medina writes a series of books called Brain Rules. And I have his book, Brain Rules for Aging Well. And he shares really compelling research about as you age, the more you spend time with people that you may not necessarily agree with, but with whom you can have polite conversations where you're listening actively to each other's perspective. Folks in those study groups um, who've been researched on a really large scale, they remain cognitively healthy, but also more physiologically healthy, uh, which again, I find really 
fascinating. But essentially, they stave off dementia by engaging with others uh, and being active in their listening and that engagement. And by active listening, it simply means listening to understand rather than listening to simply respond and give your opinion. So these working with others, these um, aspects online and in person also lead to um, deeper learning, but also cognitive health. Finally, if we think about leveraging this abundance of information um, as instructors and learners, again, by funneling our attention and being in intentional about selecting, organizing and integrating, um, I think it's helpful to think about, again, a continuum where we start in our comfort zone, but we slowly get more public in our teaching and in our learning. And by being public, I, I use, uh, for example, microblogging, like using Twitter, LinkedIn for my students to share their understanding of, or their thoughts on an article that we looked at in class, or by creating their own blogs, their own websites, um, and other sort of products that demonstrate their understanding. And I'll just share with you, actually I'll pause here before I go to the quote. So I've been researching this and also kind of charting my own experience as an instructor. And I always experience a real dip in the learning at the beginning of the process where I say, okay, write down um, your understanding and add a picture, draw your understanding as well as writing down the content in your words. And this is where I get resistance where students will say, I'm not creative, I can't do this, I'm just gonna use my words, I'll elaborate using my words. Or they say, um, I'm not good at drawing, I don't, I'm not a child, I don't have crayons at home, no thank you. And so what I do is I begin with that scarcity mindset. What I've learned over the last couple of years is I begin my courses by sharing these carefully curated course-related materials and then together we process them and think about different ways that we could represent the information with images and words. And then we share them within this safe space of the learning management system. So you're not really being vulnerable because everybody else is sharing either their drawing or a diagram that they've put up, say using a PowerPoint. And in that stage, that's when I really notice a dip in sort of the atmosphere of the class, students are frustrated. They don't really want to do this. They want multiple choice questions. They want to write essays. They kind of want to take in the information like a tape recorder and kind of re-represent it to me um, in those different formats that they're comfortable with. So I share my work, students share each other's work. And then oh, as the course progresses, we start to get a bit more public. Um, and that means, as I said, uh, tweeting their understanding but also with what they're creating by hand, I have them create digitally, again, with very slow step-by-step -step activities where they might first create a PowerPoint. And then after that, maybe an infographic using a free online tool. And this is where you see the sparks start to fly and people really um, praising each other's work, asking if they could borrow it for their workplace. Uh, another student used to print all of hers and put them on her fridge and her little brothers and sisters used to, you know, ask about the content that was there. And because she had created it and put those images and words, she was able to uh, explain the information with great fluency. And then those artifacts or those products they create, they start to share more widely. And they do that often through creating their own website. So I have an activity, an assignment that I have them do called a course synthesis. Uh, let me just see what the, okay. I will share information at the end about sort of the tools that I use. For now, I'll share my process. Um, so the course synthesis assignment is kind of like a portfolio, but it has two pieces. One piece is the course content. They're synthesizing an entire course in digital form, um, usually with a website but they've started in week one to start synthesizing information from week to week. Let's look at what we did last week. How does that compare? How is it different? What's similar? And then they're already drawing and creating from, you know, the early weeks and then making it more digital 
So what they create each week as part of their learning, they then put into their website, for example, or they create an ebook. So that's one half of their course synthesis assignment. The other half is their digital identity. And that's where they get to showcase their competencies related to their career. So as they're learning in the course, they also answer questions along the way about the relevance of the course content to what they're currently doing professionally or what they aspire to do professionally. So by the end of the course, they're simply going back and collating what they've created as part of their learning each week into a product, a digital product that they can then share publicly. Um, in some classes, I have students blog, which is public, and I usually do that in the last third of the class. And again, I get great resistance because folks are vulnerable, right? They, it's really safe within a classroom to say what you think. But the more publicly you do that, you're open to disagreement or people pointing out something you may have missed out. But as part of your course, if you're getting a grade for being vulnerable, if you're getting a grade for asking questions and seeking feedback, you're more apt to actually try it out and then get comfortable with it. So I've been researching this and trying to get students' perceptions above and beyond what I see them feeling uh, at the beginning of the course and at the end. And I chose two kind of representative sets of um, qualitative data for you. And the one on the left here, I just want to point out that the students by the end of the course feel they can take the tools with them to continue to learn about the field that they chose and to develop themselves. And that's really what I see my role as, is helping them develop skills and mindsets so that they can continue without me, but they have a toolkit and then evidence that's in public that shows, you know, I, I can do this. I can continue to develop myself and continue to learn. And this quote on the right really shows how, yes, they were occasionally frustrated um, with new technology. And by that, anything outside of the learning management system was categorized as new technology. So Twitter, for example, was new for some of them. And I respect that and I give them time to get acclimated to it. But what I like at the end here is they say that to communicate, share knowledge and spread understanding of the topics, that's really what they have learned as a result of taking these steps to learn out loud. And there's a researcher, an anthropologist who is also a really generous um, educator and shares all of his work named Michael Wesch, who talks about having his students go from being knowledgeable to knowledge able. And he does so in similar ways, but by having students go outside of the classroom and find examples of course concepts, take pictures of them, blog about them, vlog or do a video log about them, share them in the class and then share them publicly. So I really like that way of looking at it. It's going from knowledgeable, which is important, to knowledge able. So as I round the corner to the end, I just want to remind you that all of us has grown up with this scarcity mindset of learning and this illusion of fluency that we really need to be aware of now because that scarcity mindset doesn't serve us with this abundance of information and swimming in information and we really have to think about making a shift and I really like uh, Lewin's change model to help me think about change. Um, I teach it in one of my business courses about how organizations change and any meaningful change starts with this notion of unfreezing and that means unfreezing previous practices, norms, procedures, etc. And that is a, a painful stage initially to unfreeze and let go. But that does open you up for change and forming new habits and testing the waters, so to speak. And as you see success and get evidence of the positives that come out of that change, you can then freeze and move forward with that um, way of doing things or way of learning. And so why now? Why am I so excited about this now? Why does this matter so much to me now? Um, I think now is probably the best time in our lives that we will be able to seize this opportunity to unfreeze based on the enormous disruption that started in March 2020 with the global pandemic. Uh, all of our norms and practices and ways of being and doing and communicating and learning were disrupted globally, not just in the North Country or Southeast on Southeastern Ontario, 
This is globally in our families, in our workplace, and in our learning. And in the workplace, we have the great resignation. So this is real. People are rethinking everything that they do because they have kind of unfrozen. Now we have this great opportunity to change, to try new things, to form new habits, and as educators and learners to try to learn out loud and to try to really apply some of these study findings that are over a century old. So as we turn our sights to um, the future and what we actually want to do, I want to kind of turn that initial question on its head. And instead of asking you, how do we learn? I want you to think about how will we learn? And I'm hoping that you'll seize this opportunity to try learning out loud uh, publicly and internally. So thank you all for listening. And I am happy to field questions now, including the earlier question about uh, tools that I use.